Hey everybody, today I'm counting down my top 10 strategy games that use dice. Now typically I don't like dice in games, at least in the traditional sense of rolling to resolve things. However, I do really enjoy it when designers use dice in kind of fresh and innovative and more deterministic um, ways. Um, I really love all these games on this list, so there's no real kind of ones that are on there for the sake of it. However, I have actually made a top 11 list um, because I've got one straggler which just, um, just missed out on the top 10 that I want to touch upon and it's probably going to be a long time before I make a volume two of this list so I thought I'd put it all together. So yeah I really like all these games so hopefully there's something on here that catches your attention and um, you know, I really think there's going to be something on here that you can enjoy. So at number 11, uh, kind of an honourable mention, I've got Merlin. Now Merlin is um, pretty much your traditional roll, to roll, well, roll and move style game where you are you have a bunch of your own coloured dice you roll in them at the start of your turn, and then you're basically spending them in um, in any order you want in order to move around this rondelle. Um, and different spots that you land on kind of give you different actions, and you're trying to collect shields to fight off kind of invaders, um, which will give you negative points at the end of the round. You can collect different cubes to give you kind of area control, um, and do lots of different things. Um, there's also a white dice that you roll um, or on your turn, and you can kind of spend that by moving either way on this rondelle, but the problem is that all the other players have an investment in that in that Merlin pawn as well, because um, obviously when you use it, you're gonna move it for another player, which means that you can kind of alter the actions that they can take. Um, it's a pretty simple game in the essence of it, but however, kind of mapping out your turn can be quite difficult. There's a lot of different kind of plates to, um, you know, to balance and spin at the same time. Um, also, there's some really good expansions for this one, and this is one of those games that I think um, Almost the expansions are necessities, especially the Arthur expansion, which puts a, another rondelle inside the original rondelle and um, gives you another dice to roll in your turn as well. So you've got basically five dice, three of your own colour, one white dice and one black dice, which um, controls Arthur and again gives you more different actions you can take. But there's a lot to do. Um, you're trying to fulfil these different mission cards to give you points. You're trying to, as I said, control these different areas. Um, you're trying to um, fight off these invaders. Um, and just get points in lots of different ways. But it's a really nice game. Um, Production-wise, it's excellent from Queen Games, and it looks really pretty as well. So Stefan Feld makes lots of great games, and there might even be a couple more on this list. So at number 11, I have Merlin. Uh, at number 10, I have Marco Polo. Um, and this can be either the original Voyages of Marco Polo or the newer Marco Polo 2 um, in service of the Khan. Um, this is your kind of traditional worker placement style game. However, you're using the dice um, as your workers. And at the start of your turn, you're rolling five, five dice and then basically in turn allocating these dice into different action spots. Um, however, simply having the higher dice values isn't going to um, be um, you know, always beneficial because although if you get to spots first and you're spending your higher dice, um, then you're going to get more powerful returns such as more resources or get to travel around the map faster. But if um, somebody goes onto these worker placement spots before you do, um, then the higher dice are actually going to cost you more money to use that spot as well. So there is that bit of a balancing act and you do want kind of the high numbers and low numbers. There's a great kind of sense of engine building in this game as you're traveling around this map of Asia, getting more worker placement spots um, and more kind of engine building um, locations. Uh, but it's just a really smooth experience. Um, it goes very quickly. It takes about an hour and it pretty much have all, has all the... Well, everything you want from a worker placement game. Additionally, everybody gets a unique player power, which are very powerful, um, and you know you feel distinctively stronger than your opponents, but they have the same. So, um, but yeah, a really good experience, and um, just widely acclaimed, and rightly so. It's just almost a faultless worker placement game that uses dice as your workers. So that's number ten, um, either of the Marco Polo games. At number nine, I have my second Steffenfeld game. This is The Castles of Burgundy. Now, this is um, no doubt Steffenfeld's most popular game to date. Um, this one, you are basically um, on your turn, you're rolling two dice um, and then spending those dice to take different actions. And typically, you're going to be taking um, tiles off the central board, and the dice is going to kind of determine which locations you can take those tiles from. And then, once, once you've taken those tiles, they're going to go onto your personal board, and then additionally, you can spend more dice to um, place them onto your own player board to get points in loads of different ways. Um, the, the mitigation of the dice in this game is really good because you can spend, um, spend 
or you spend a die to get more of these workers which let you manipulate your dice either by you know increasing or decreasing the pit value um, there's loads of cool combos you can get in this one score points in in loads of different ways um, and it's just a really fun pretty um you know a low barrier to entry with this one but it still feels very engaging there's a lot to sink your teeth into lots of different strategies you can take and um, it's just a wonderfully put together game that is the castles of burgundy at number nine uh, at number eight i have twa now twa is a pretty um a pretty unique game in the way it plays this one again you um, have a bunch of dice that you're rolling at the start of your turn based on how you've got your workers deployed on either the the kind of the merchant buildings the um, the church and the military buildings because you have basically three different dice types. You've got yellow dice, red dice, and white dice, and they are going to let you use those dice in kind of different ways based on these cards that you can collect throughout the game. Um, but the, the trick of this game is that your dice that you roll aren't necessarily yours because they're kind of um, free for, or other players can buy those dice off you without your consent by paying you money. Um, so, you know, if you're going to roll a lot of high, high numbers, then we're probably going to have them bought off you. Um, and basically, you're going to be spending those dice on these different um, merchant cards or these different um, action cards that you're going to accumulate. And um, basically do different things to get lots of different victory points. Uh, you've also got to use these military dice to fight off these kind of communal threats to um, to Twa, um, you know, such as invaders and stuff like that, which can really kind of um, you know mess with the game. Um, and it's just a real kind of efficiency puzzle about how you're going to spend your dice. You know, bearing in mind that you're going to have some bought off you, you know, buying them off other players. Um, you know, being frugal with your money to make sure that you've got enough to you know give yourself a bit of wiggle room in case you have your dice bought off you um, just a really nice game with a ton of variability um, especially with the expansion you're going to have a bunch of different cards that and you only use a few um, in each of the games so you're never really going to play the exact same game twice and a lot of the cards synergize with each other in loads of really dynamic ways so uh, a really fantastic game a little bit obtuse you know um, there's not really anything else out there apart from um, Black Angel which was kind of a sequel to this game but there's nothing else really out there that feels like Twa to me. A little bit more confrontational in terms of people buying your dice off you um, you know it doesn't always feel like the best thing but it's just a part of the game and it just works very very well and um, the artwork is quite unique as well it's got that really medieval look and it just works really well and it's just a, a great game so that is Twa at number eight. Um, at number seven, I have Signorie. Um, this is a, a, a dice drafting game, so you're going to basically spending turns to, or taking turns to take dice from the board and put them onto your own action board. But the, the dice that you're taking, or uh, basically, it's just a standard D6, and you're basically determining how much discount you're going to get on taking these different actions, because the actions take different kind of, um, different costs, and for each kind of number on the dice you're going to get um, a, you know a minus one discount on each of those but again you think why don't I always just take the higher dice you don't want to take the higher dice all the time because um, at the end of the round if you're kind of below a certain threshold of dice um, then you are going to get a bonus and you're going to want those bonuses because they're very uh, you know very important and can give you um, you know a, quite an advantage there's a little bit going on in here in terms of engine building because you can go to these certain action spots and um, you know move these tokens around and give yourself kind of more powerful turns. So whenever you take a certain um, a certain die in the future turns, you can get uh, more powerful turns. There's a good sense of ramping up in this one. You are training your family members and sending them off to help different um, different noble families, getting lots of victory points in different ways, and it's just a really good dice drafting experience. One that's tense because you know you want those dice that other players want as well. Um, so player order is very important and it's just um, a really engaging game and um, just again really well put together and I can't really think of anything I don't like about Signorie. It's just um, it's just fantastic. So definitely check that one out. Uh, at number six I have Teo Te Wakan. Um, this one came out a couple of years ago now and um, it's another rondelle game. However the, the dice in this game are used almost as like tokens. Um, they're not your standard, you know, you're, you're not kind of putting them down or, or based on the dice value. You're basically moving them around clockwise on this rondelle. And you can move them one, two or three spaces. And if you line them up, you can get more powerful bonuses. And also the, the higher the pip values of the dice, the more powerful bonuses you're going to get as well. 
But the trick is that when you go to a certain spot, that dice is going to level up. So, you know, it starts off at level one, then it goes to level two, level three, level four. And again, the more, the more higher they are, then the more powerful resources you're gonna get in return. However, once it gets to level six, it's going to ascend and go, and basically the dice is going to die and go back down to level one. Um, but you get to take a, a, um, a kind of a bonus for doing so. But it really is a balancing act of trying to keep all your dice as a high value. But when, uh, when the end of the round triggers, you want your dice to be kind of lower values because you're gonna to have to pay them more food if, you, if they are the higher levels. Um, it really is your kind of typical Euro in terms of loads of tracks to climb up and down. Um, you know, you've got the central pyramid, which is, Basically, you're collecting tiles and matching symbols to build this whole 3D, almost like a 3D Mahjong kind of puzzle. But it's a, a really great game. Lots going on, um, but loads of you know technologies you can go down to kind of alter the rules. You've got the you know or just the, the balance of the dice is really great. Lining up your turns, um, you know, knowing when to do what, um, knowing when to be opportunistic to use certain tiles because if other players are on the tiles that you want to use, then you're gonna to have to pay more of your, your cocoa, which is like your currency in the game. Um, and it just really is a fantastic game. Um, on the slightly heavier side of things, you know, probably bordering on that medium heavyweight, you know, almost going into the heavyweight style of games, but a really rewarding game and I absolutely love it. So that is um, Teo Te Wakan. Uh, at number five, I have um, my third Steffenfeld game. This is the Oracle of Delphi. Uh, this one has quite a few similarities to the Castles of Burgundy, but instead of rolling two dice, you are rolling, um, you're rolling three. Um, and those are basically matching all these different symbols on the board, or, or they've basically got a different color assigned to each of the die faces. And you're gonna use those dice in loads of different ways. Um, the idea of the game is it's a kind of uh, a race as you're trying to fulfill a number of different objectives by traveling around to kind of ancient Greece, um, collecting different statues and moving them to different plinths and slaying different monsters and stuff like this and making different offerings. But the dice, kind of drive everything in the game. You're gonna use them to move from different hexes to different hexes. You're going to use them to, cut, to pick up things onto your ship. You're gonna use them to charge up these different powers that you've got. And those powers can give you really powerful advantages such as you know, teleporting anywhere on the map or fighting monsters without having to spend dice and lots of different things like that. So it's one of those games that you really do want to do everything. You're always engaged because on other players' turns, when they, when they roll their dice, you get to charge up one of your powers. Um, it's really fantastic, really tense. Um, again, it feels quite different than a lot of Feld's games because I can't really think of any other racing games that he's made. But that, that kind of great, or that, that mitigation you've got is there because you can use these lightning bolt tokens to change the, um, to change the dice or, or what the kind of dice mean or what they can do. So if you like, um, if you like the me mechanics of Castles of Burgundy, but you want something quite a bit different, then um, the Oracle of Delphi is definitely one to check out. And I think this is one of his kind of unsung games, although I think a lot of the people who've played it like it, it just hasn't really blown up to the, to the level that I thought it would have, because it really is a fun game. And um, there's a lot going on and it's all dice driven and it's all very entertaining. So that is the Oracle of Delphi, uh, a fantastic game. Um, at number four, I have another dice drafting game. This is Coimbra. Coimbra is um, a, quite an interesting game in terms of its dice drafting because you're not only drafting dice based on the pit values, um, you're also drafting them based on the color of the dice because um, you are essentially um, taking these dice in order to place them down or to give you priority to um, to take these different action cards, which can give you loads of different engine building kind of ways to, to you know, to, to tailor your game. Um, but the, the color of the dice is important as well because they're gonna to relate to different tracks that you, um, that they are associated with. So you've got like a money track, you've got like a, a travel track, you've got ones that give you kind of military points and stuff like that. So there's, there really is that kind of double-edged sword that you want the higher dice values in order to get priority on the cards, but Additionally, if you take the high dice values, you're gonna to have to pay, pay more to take those cards in the first place. So there is that real kind of, um, you know, that tension of, can I afford this? Um, you know, what track is this associated to? Is this going to trigger off a lot of my cards that I've already bought in order to get the most out of my engine? Um, there's um, a map you're traveling around to get different bonuses. 
Um, there's loads of end game cards that you can kind of invest in as well. And it just is um, a wonderful package, a really bright, colorful artwork. Um, it plays nice and quickly. Um, the tension of the dice draft is extremely strong because of all the different reasons I mentioned. So um, just a, a rock solid game that I think is um, a wonderful experience. That is Coimbra. At number three, I have Grand Austria Hotel. Now this is, um, I suppose it's almost in a way a dice drafting game, but this one you are rolling a common pool of dice at the beginning of the game and you are allocating them to different action spaces. So the one, all the ones you roll will be allocated to a certain action, all the twos, all the threes, all the fours, all the fives, and all the sixes. Um, and then you're basically taking turns to use uh, or to draft one of those dice from, the, from that board, which will obviously choose or determine the actions you can take. But the, the number of the dice allocated to that spot is important because the more dice there is the more powerful of the action you can take. Um, however, obviously there's a, a balancing act in terms of are you going to take those actions when they, are, when they are the most powerful or are you going to take the actions that only have maybe one die associated to them before your opponent gets there because that or the opportunity to take that certain action just won't be there when it's your turn. Uh, additionally, the, the game works in a in a snaking method as well. So play one will go, then two, then three, and then three, then two, then one, which just really does ramp up the, the tension of taking the dice that you really want. Um, again, loads of engine building in this one. Um, you, know, you can use these different staff cards to do lots of different things, but the idea of the game is that you are trying to basically prepare these different rooms for these guests. You're drafting these guests into your hotel, trying to feed them, um, getting rewards based on if you feed them or not and then allocating them to a certain room of their color. Um, but there's loads of cool synergies, there's loads of combat combos you can do. Um, you're trying to climb, again, climb different tracks in order to not, not to suffer different punishments. Um, again, just trying to pre prepare rooms, trying to bring guests in, collect different dishes to feed them. Um, just a, a really cool, and a, a cool game that works well thematically as well. Just a completely different theme, and that theme just works well with the mechanisms pretty easy to understand because of the theme and easy to explain as well but really fun really dynamic and um, lots of different things to try out as well that was the grand austria hotel at number three um, a wonderful game um, at number two i have definitely the heaviest game on this list in terms of its you know complexity um, this is tris magistus um, again another dice drafting game but this one much like coimbra where you're using kind of two different things to weigh up your decisions this one you're actually using three different methods and because the, the, the color of the dice is important and you've got three different colors, you've got the black, white and red dice, um, you've got the symbol on the dice and you've got the actual number of dice in that pool as well. Uh, the number of the dice in the pool is important because when you're drafting one, that's how many actions you get on the turn. Uh, the symbols is going to determine um, basically the different elements you can bring onto your board um, or the different kind of resources. and. Um, Basically, there's there's a lot to explain in this game, but basically you're trying to um, fulfill different kind of experiments and formulas by collecting different resources and trading in cards. However, there's a lot of manipulation in the game as you're trying to kind of um, transmuting one resource to another. You are building up your little um, kind of ultimate formula you're, um, by when you fulfill different missions, you get to take these tokens and put them onto your central board, which is going to give you bonuses. Um, you can kind of build your engine up as you take these different um, artifacts and put them on your board. And then whenever you transmute one to another, you get to trigger those artifacts, which again, give you more and more bonuses. Um, it's a really, um, it's a total brain burner because there is so much going on. However, I just love it in this one. Um, I don't think it paralyzes the game. I don't think it, it's to a point where it's overwhelming. Um, I just think it's really something to sink your teeth into and get lost in. Um, people say that the rules are a little bit too, a bit too much. However, I think um, it's not a massive step above games like Teotihuacan or Coimbra, but it is just that, that, next, that next level to dive into. But um, I love this game. This, there's probably a bit too much to cover in this kind of a short snippet, but I couldn't recommend this enough. It's one of my absolute favorite games and it's just wonderful. Um, so if you like heavier games, definitely check out Trismegistus, um, particularly if you like dice drafting. So number two, Trismegistus. Um, and finally, at number one, I have Lorenzo Il Magnifico. Um, ironically, this one, probably the dice have the least um, kind of 
engaged way with the game. I mean, there's not the dice are simply a randomizer to determine how strong your workers in the game are. Because um, at the start of your or every round, you're going to have a number of workers um, associated to a different color, and those different colors are associated to a different dice. And at the start of the turn, you're going to roll those dice, and they're going to basically determine the strength of that worker for all the players. So all your orange workers might be, um, you know, strength five, and all your black workers might be strength one. And that's so important because it's going to to determine what actions you could or which action cards you can take and kind of any any if you want to kind of get to the higher echelon of that card drafting you're going to have to spend these different servants in order to boost or bolster up your um, your strength of your workers but the cool thing is that you know everybody's uh, singing from the same hymn sheet there's not going to be one player that can do something that the other players can't do uh, simply because they've rolled a higher dice so the, the, the game is essentially a, um, an engine builder game. You're collecting these different cards and then running your engine to get loads of different resources. Um, you're collecting kind of points for end game scoring and you can really build up your engine in terms of making your actions stronger. For example, you might take a, a worker that makes all your or whenever you take a blue card, you might take it at a value too stronger, or you know the same applies to all the different cards. Um, but this, in terms of worker placement games, I don't think there's anything better than Lorenzo Il Magnifico, and a big part of that is because of the the way the dice are used in the game. I really do love that. It always keeps the game feeling fresh because some rounds you might be really powerful and take all those higher cards, um, and some games you might be really struggling um, because you simply keep rolling low and have to keep collecting servants to spend them. But yeah, a really great game. You know, if you like engine building, this one is the game to go for because um, you can really get some satisfying things going. Again, trying to climb different tracks, not to su not to suffer punishments. But yeah, all about that engine building. When you do kind of spend your dice in order to run your engine, you know, if you if you're applying the higher level dice, then you can get um, a load of rewards, and it can feel extremely satisfying. Um, and yeah, just a wonderful game. Um, plays pretty quickly. Um, quite, you know, the, the order of the different cards come out is can really kind of change the game up. The expansions to the game are really good as well, you know, because you can use different like, unique player powers and stuff. But yeah, definitely want to check out. I couldn't recommend it enough, and it's one of my absolute top top tier games. So uh, that concludes my top eleven um, strategy games that use dice. Um, I hope there's something on here that's um, caught your attention. I see, Stefan Feld's kind of got quite a a strong you know, footprint on this list and so have the kind of Italian conglomerate of game designers, you know, your Tashinis, um, your Brasinis, or people like that. But yeah, uh, definitely one of my favourite genres of games and um, these are all pretty much in my top, probably my top 30 games or so of all time. So, you know, considering that's 11 games, uh, you can see it pretty much does dominate my, my favourite type of game. So I hope you've enjoyed this list. If you have, please hit like and subscribe to my channel and check out my other videos too. For everyone else, I'll see you next time on Chairman of the Board. Bye.